Yes, ma'am. Uh, I am just in the process of making the program live. We are good to go, ma'am. Yes. Can we have the first slide, please? Yes, ma'am. I welcome everyone to the Public Awareness Committee Foxy webinar with the South Zone Societies. Uh, we are happy to announce that this is the 14th episode in this series. This is a proper <clears throat> webinar series by the Public Awareness Com Committee, which is focused on the themes related to the public awareness activities in that month. So this time we have August, which is the Breastfeeding Awareness Month, and the September, which is the Nutrition Month. So that is why we have selected anemia, nutrition in pregnancy, and breastfeeding as our topics. I would now uh, invite everybody to the e inauguration of this webinar. Can we have the inauguration slide, please? Can you please play a Thank you, Abhishek. Uh, we now move forward with the introduction of our chairperson, Dr. Priyankul Roy. Uh, it is his uh, perception that we are conducting this series. We welcome you, Dr. Priyankul, uh, to give your welcome address and introduce our guest of honor today. Thank you so much, uh, Monica. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Monica. And it's uh, indeed a pleasure that all of you have joined us today in this wonderful program. And this, as Monica has said, is our 14th episode. And I would, of course, like to first of all thank our uh, president, Dr. Rishikesh Paisa, Dr. Madhuri Patel, ma'am, and Dr. Alka Pandey, ma'am, who are the lighting source for our uh, for our PSC activities. And of course, Dr. Kalyan Barmati, who is the national coordinator. Most of our activities would not be possible without the Dr. Monica and Dr. Shatabdi, who, who work day in and day out for a lot of PSC activities that we do. We have brilliant conveners as well. And for the South Zone, we have Dr. Marty Rajchikar, ma'am, and Dr. Uh, Raghavandar Basad, sir, who also are working very hard to make all the activities of PSC a success. So today we have our chief guest with us, Dr. Rishikesh Paisa, who is here for some time, his family. And we have our guest of honors, Dr. Palani Ampal, sir, and Dr. Kutin I welcome both of you to this program. For the scientific session, we have our speakers with us, Dr. Vidya Thobi, ma'am, and Dr. Chinmay, ma'am. I welcome the two of you. Yeah. 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 With chairpersons, Dr. Uh, Gigi Selvan, Dr. Ratha Madhavi, and Dr. Vimash Shankar, and our panel discussion, we have our moderators, Dr. Mahathir Rajchekar, and Dr. Rajshi Palanis, ma'am, and our expert, Dr. Umayal, ma'am, and with a battery of panelists, Dr. Sri Harsha, Dr. Basil Matthews, Dr. Annapurna, uh, Dr. Uh, Purushottam, Dr. Anit Kumar, Dr. Sarita, Dr. Nirmal Devi, Dr. Dekha Rajesh, Dr. Shushma, and Dr. Sundar. So I welcome all of you to this program, and I hand this session back to uh, Dr. Monica to introduce the guest of honors and proceed with the program, please. Okay, I think, uh, okay. So I will go ahead with the introduction of the guest of honors. I would first of all like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Palanya Pansar. Can I have the CV slide, please? Yeah, Palanya Pansar is a professor in HOD, Department of OBGYN at the Ramchandra Medical College in Chennai. He has won a number of awards uh, to his credit, being junior, being senior, and he's one of the 
uh, I would say uh, academics apart. I think I would tell him as one of the fitness freaks of today's day, and we all youngsters also take a lot of motivation from him towards losing weight and towards getting motivated towards getting fit back again. And uh, and that is something that we definitely look forward to. So, sir, I would like to request you for a kind few words of uh, blessings for everyone. And I would also like to uh, this. Uh, I would like to request, sir, who's, I see is traveling in his car, but he has joined us. Thank you, sir, for your commitment. Requesting you for a few words of blessings for everyone. Uh, good evening, uh, all of you. Priyankur, uh, Professor Shekharan, uh, Gigi, Selvam, Dr. Bharati, and others whom I'm not able to see on the slides. And um, uh, it's been a fantastic uh, journey of the PAC committee of uh, Foxy and uh, 14th episode. And I'm uh, very happy to hear that. And the topics have been very aptly chosen by uh, Dr. Monica, who's been uh, instrumental in calling me and uh, doing uh, the activities of the PAC committee. And it is fantastic to see the webinar being, uh, you know, um, modeled so beautifully by uh, Priyankur and he used the word fit and it was looking very fit and uh, Priyankur you don't have to lose weight some people don't look good if you lose weight Priyankur so you look the same and uh, here we have the micronutrients and the macronutrients of, pre of in pregnancy and the anemia panel and the breastfeeding and uh, very very aptly chosen and I'm very happy to share the uh, screen with Dr. Shekharan um, who's, of course, one of the pillars of uh, South India. And I'm also able to see Dr. Chinmayi, Dr. Vidya, who will be part of the um, scientific program as well. And uh, absolutely fantastic, uh, Priyankur. What is very, uh, not very great is this entire team is not traveling to uh, South for the VP conference to Kodekanel, whereas I'm on the way to uh, Kodekanel. And I only wish all of you could come to Kodekanel in this uh, uh, lovely weather in uh, South India. Um, Anyway, it's been very fantastic and Priyankur is such a lovely friend of mine and uh, I've, I've seen him grow from his Jipma days and uh, it's been absolutely nice being related to uh, Priyankur on the uh, Foxy Connect and uh, I'm sure we will have more of this and uh, I wish the uh, webinar series a very great success and uh, thank you for inviting me, uh, Priyankur and Monica. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for being here. And of course, on the official platform, I'd like to congratulate you for getting elected as a VP like for Foxy, which I tell us will come today in an hour or so. So thank congratulations you, thank you. for that. Uh, thank you, Priyankur. I hope the results are out. Yeah. Thank, yeah. You. thank you. And uh, now I would like to introduce, of course, Dr. P.K. Shekharan, sir. Uh, the, sir is, of course, one of the stalwarts, sir, as Palanipan sir has already said, a stalwart whom we all look forward to. We have all learned from his teachings. We have all heard his talks and we have grown on our way to whatever we are today. So uh, it's a pleasure that Shekharan sir has accepted our invite and is here. He is a pro pro professor, a former professor in head department of OBGYN at the prestigious Government Medical College, Calicut. He has been a past vice president of Foxy long, long back in 2010. He is one of the pillars of KFOG and a pillar of Foxy, I would say, in the today's day as well. Sir has been a co-author of many FICO guidelines on GDD, etc. We know him as a as a pillar of GDD, as a figure of GDD worldwide as well. Sir, it's a pleasure you have joined us, requesting you to say a few words of blessings for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Prenko. Thank you, Prenko. Uh, I am too happy to see that uh, so sincere a person like Dr. Prenko has become the chairperson of the one of the important committees of Oxy. And I am sure with his uh, earnest approach to the problems and the duties, he will go higher and higher. And I hope to see him at the higher level. That's uh, introductory. I am very happy to see the Public Awareness Committee is organizing a series of webinars for the benefit of the members, not only for the public, but we should also be aware of certain problems. And programs are programs like this will help our members also to improve our practice. Today's three topics, I am very happy to see my colleagues and respected members of the faculty Many of them, Dr. D.G. Selvan, Dr. Chinmay Rathe, and Dr. Vidya Tobi, and uh, many more. Uh, so all are very important and senior people to tell us what is the importance of all these three topics. The selection of the topic for the evening is also important. One is the nutrition in pregnancy where we may not be seriously considering what to give, what not to give, or what's important. So that is being covered in a very good way in micro and macronutrients. Next important thing is uh, 
the breastfeeding in premature babies that is a very important thing that we usually see and even the public and the people accept that the preterm babies are given to the neonatal icu and we forget everything about it we means the for obstetricians as well as the patient and their relatives they think that that is the safest way as an uh, one remark about this thing is i will say that if the baby is not having any respiratory problem the baby must be with the baby mother that is my request all of you to do so an elaboration madam will help us to learn many things next important thing as palani has also dr palani appan of course i call him palani because i know him from very long long period as a youngster coming to the national level and very happy about him also so dr palani has mentioned about the importance of the anemia in pregnancy and it is being covered in a elaborate way by a panel discussion and these are all going to benefit all of us so once again congratulations dr pengur thanks foxy for uh, having such a program thanks all the uh, very renowned faculty members and the chairpersons and the panelists for having such a thoughtful program being organized and uh, we are all eagerly awaiting for your deliberation thank you pengur once again for including thank you shekharan sir for joining us thank you for your wonderful message just just a just a thought provoking thing i mean we see, uh, we juniors we may uh, of course with with the with the law of the world we will grow older with every year but the thing is when our teachers call us by that first name it still means a lot to all of us and i'm sure it meant a lot to palani appan sir as well when he called him palani so that means a lot to all of us for so the love and respect that uh, love that you give to us juniors is something that we always take forward and that makes us grow as well sir thank you so much for joining us sir always loved and learned a lot from you sir thank you and we'll continue learning from you always thank you sir thank you so i would now like to hand over the session to monica to kindly take over the scientific session thank you dr priyankur thank you balinappan sir and congratulations and thank you shekran sir for joining us for this inauguration ceremony and gracing the occasion we now move forward to the academic session this is the first session uh, on nutrition the topic is micro and macro nutrients in pregnancy Let me welcome our chairpersons for the same, Dr. Gigi Selvan, ma'am. Her special interests include high-risk pregnancies, ultrasound, and obstetrics and social obstetrics and adolescent gynecology. She has been a faculty member in IACMCH since 1994. She has been conducting Foxy ultrasound certificate courses since 1994, conducting the reproductive medicine courses in INA since 2009. She has been conducting training at the E.N. Brunner School of Ultrasound Preliminary, and has attended many conferences and presented many papers too. We welcome you, ma'am. Our next chairperson for today's session is Dr. Radha Madhuri, ma'am. She is the founder president of Tiruvannamalai Society. She is a director of Raja Malli Specialty Hospital and director of the Institute of Paramedical Sciences with the same name. She is practicing gynecologist uh, since 1994, and she has conducted three annual conferences. We welcome both of you, ma'am, to invite our first speaker, Dr. Vidya Tobi, ma'am. Yigi, ma'am, you can take over the session. Ma'am, please unmute. So good evening, Monica. Thank you for the introduction and namaste to all of you. It's nice to see Chagran Professor Chagran Sir, Pallini Appan, and all the family of and Chinmay too. Hello to all of you. Nice to see you like this. So this, I'll move on to today's topic: the micro and the macro nutrients for pregnancy. That is a very important thing. Unless the mother is healthy, the offspring is not going to be healthy. So this has to be taken care of. Not only the macro, like the iron and the calcium we write as protein the micronutrients also should be taken into consideration and we have dr vidya tobi here to enlighten us with this welcome ma'am and thank she you. had been the, thank you thank you and she had been the professor and unit head department obigain all i mean medical college vijayapur an icog governing council member from 21 to 23 a chairperson food and drug medico surgical equipment committee foxy 2018 to 2020 a best committee dr mehru daro hansotia award in 2020 the org 
Nicing Chairperson of KSOGA in 2016, a EC member of KSOGA, Academic Council member of Women University, a national corresponding editor of JOGI from 2017 to 2019, an editorial mem member of Alamin Journal of Medical Sciences. She has published a lot of national and international journals and been a PG guide and examiner. And of course, she, she has conducted various workshops and CMEs. Welcome you, ma'am, to this webinar on PAC, yeah. which is conducted by the PAC, and the stage is yours. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. J.G. Selvan. Uh, this is my little old uh, whatever CV they have presented. At present, I am a Karnataka state president, and I bring a lot of greetings from my state, and it is very, very, very much pleasure to meet all of you. Uh, through webinar and uh, I'm very happy that Priyankur has brought out uh, this public uh, through his public awareness committee uh, so many uh, things uh, together especially the breastfeeding week is just over actually the breastfeeding week should be uh, 24 by 7 and 365 days but we celebrate only for the first and seventh at least that awareness comes and next month, I must say that September is a nutrition month. So everybody should make the awareness of nutrition. And the topic which was given by Priyanku to me uh, is micro and micronutrients. I thank the conveners also, Dr. Monica, who, who was in constant touch with me, Dr. Shatabdi uh, Day, our own Bharti Rashekhar, Raghavendra Prasad, Dr. Kalyan Baramade. And I thank our Foxy president, Dr. Rishikesh Pai, Madhuri Patel and Alka Pandey, who are the pillars of our Foxy at present and always. So next slide, please. Can you change, Abhishek? Go on changing. Next slide, please. So today, something we are talking on maternal nutrition and the term maternal nutrition focuses attention towards nutritional status of women as it relates to bearing and nurturing the children. The maternal nutrition comprises of anthropometric factors such as pre-pregnancy BMI and uh, gestational weight gain as well as the intake of balanced diet and micronutrients. This is very important. So always whenever uh, we assess the nutritional risk and now the FIGO's nutrition checklist which we imbibe. So in that first is whenever any antenatal patient comes to your clinic you have to check her weight, you have to take calorie count, what she eats, and what is the uh, weight at present, pre-pregnancy weight, as well as the gestational weight gain. Uh, so you have to take the diet, recall what daily she eats. So it, uh, it uh, really comprises a comprehensive uh, nutritional risk assessment of uh, any pregnant woman. Next slide, please. Yes. So I should not uh, again and again tell about the importance of good nutrition. The health of a newborn depends on the nutritional status of the mother preconceptionally. So a well-nourished woman enters the pregnancy with the reserve of several nutrients which are required for the growing fetus without affecting her own health. That is very important. And a well-nourished woman suffers fewer complications during pregnancy if she is well-nourished. Infants develop nutritional diseases like anemia, rickets, or they suffer from infectious diseases due to lack of good immunity. Next slide, please. So what are the consequences of maternal nutrition and pregnancy outcome? The malnourished pregnant woman experience greater maternal morbidity and have a higher risk of miscarriage and preterm birth. Malnutrition is prevalent in low and middle class uh, income countries, which increases mortality and overall disease burden. Maternal protein restriction during pregnancy increases the risk of cardiovascular diseases. Next slide, please. Effect of maternal and malnutrition on fetal outcome as well. The possible harmful effect which is observed is a deficit in brain growth, which is associated with maternal malnutrition. And it is also observed that the lower the birth weight of a term infant, the greater is the deficit of mental capacity. There is again increased risk of congenital anomalies. 
Next slide, please. So woman's malnutrition is a life cycle issue. So if in infancy and early childhood, there is a suboptimal breastfeeding practices, inadequate complementary foods or infrequent feeding, it and frequent infection it leads to childhood also in childhood where there are poor diets poor health poor education in adolescent increase there are increased nutritional demands greater iron needs and early teenage pregnancies pregnancy and lactation there are higher nutritional requirements and increased micronutrient needs and short birth intervals so in these all cycles the women are vulnerable to the malnutrition throughout the life cycle of both biological and social reason there are so many factors which are there and if we see the status of maternal nutrition indicators in india we must say that they are at a poor state. So 30% of the women, they consume iron and folic acid for less than 100 or more days. And 22.9% in uh, women in India, they enter pregnancy as underweight. Though we have achieved titanus oxide injection 89%, 80% of the women go to the institutional deliveries. In spite of that, this is a very sorry figure. Average weight gain, if you see in pregnancy, is about 7 kg only. And more than 50% pregnant women are anemic. So iron consumption, iron tablet consumption is less because of various reasons. If you see here, it is just 12% in Bihar. They have done the statistics. And in the northern part of our country, the statistics is alarming. Next slide, please. Pre-pregnancy, pregnancy and postpartum nutrition is very critical for women and children's well-being. So 23% of the women are keen. And just see the obesity. 21% of the mothers are also overweight and obese. So poor nutritional status of mothers before and during pregnancy extends throughout the life course, affect the next generation, which leads to intergenerational vicious cycle of undernutrition. Intrauterine fetal growth restriction is one of the leading cause of stunting globally. So maternal nutrition, the important period one should say that preconception, during conception, and post-conception. Next slide, please. So nutrients are needed to develop maternal organs, such as uterus, placenta, and breast tissues. Body reserves will be utilized at the time of uh, delivery and lactation. First trimester, there is no significant increase in the size of fetus. Only qualitative improvement in nutrient intake is required. Second and third trimester, an increased nutrient required, uh, intake is suggested. Next slide, please. So there are FIGO recommendations for preconception care. So what can be done? The involved professional can be community health workers, nutritionists, family doctors, general practitioners, uh, patients or women go to OBG vans and midwives. So these are the people who are involved professionals where the women go. And the assessment consideration, when I just told you about the diet composition, you should ask physical activity history, height, weight, BMI, what is obesity risk. We should also see the uh, if the patient comes preconceptionally, waist circumference, anthropometry, check for her anemia, risk of specific nutritional problems, whether they, she has got low nutrient density, Inquire about the folate, iron, calcium intake, vitamin B12. We know that multiple micronutrient deficiency is very, very common. So uh, also you have to discuss about the importance of healthy diet at the point of touch. And uh, whenever uh, we talk of the behavioral problems, uh, such as screen time, weight loss counseling, risky behaviors and exposure, whether she's taking again, to to uh, means tobacco, Tobacco chewing is very common in the rural areas. Then environmental toxins, chronic disease screening and management, any supplementation, and whether preconceptionally she is taking folic acid and other required uh, supplementation. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So energy requirements, if you see during pregnancy, uh, why it is required? is to deposit fat which will be used during lactation to meet the need of increased basal metabolic rate, the development of placenta and maternal tissue and the growth of fetus. We, for this, we require the uh, greater energy during pregnancy. 
Next slide, please. Nutrition and lifestyle before and during pregnancy and lactation have been shown to induce long-term effects on the later health of the child. So increase it increases the risk of common non-communicable diseases such as obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. And this phenomena is referred to as early metabolic programming of long-term health and disease or developmental origin of adult health and disease. That's why our FOXI president, Dr. Pei, says badlao. So we have to have badlao in all aspects of our lifestyle and eating pattern. Next slide, please. So I will not go into this slide, though it is very busy. We know about the Barker uh, hypothesis, how the metabolic programming, epigenetic modification can uh, happens during antenatal period and how it affects. Uh, so uh, fetal growth restriction and others, all those things and the non-communicable diseases. So it has got its uh, own uh, cycles. That is an intergenerational cycle, which can be, definitely broken by adequate nutrition. Next slide, please. Now, uh, gestational weight gain. So what is the ideal gestational weight gain? For underweight, it is around 13 to 18. Uh, normal, it is 11 to 16. And overweight, 17 to 11. And obese, it is around 5 to 9 kgs. So we know that uh, we have to calculate this BMI pre-pregnancy and during pregnancy, you have to watch the weight gain every trimester. Next slide, please. So total in energy increases by 300 kilocalorie per day. And this energy requirement during pregnancy, if she, the woman is heavy worker, it, she has to, of course, add 300, but you have to see that she, uh, she gets adequate energy for her heavy work. So 2,925 for heavy worker, moderate 2,225. And for sedentary worker, little less, that is 1,875 plus 300 kilocalorie per day. Extra calorie they, she requires in first trimester is 85 kilocalories, second trimester 285 and third trimester 475 kilocalories. So she has to calculate. Situation where we need greater energy, one is in adolescent pregnancy, of course, the incidence, the, gradually it was, uh, uh, gradually it is coming uh, um, down, hard physical labor, multiple pregnancy, infections and malabsorption syndrome. Uh, next slide, please. So consequence of a woman's chronic energy deficiency, if she is e eating less or if she is very thin, definitely her immunity comes down. So infections, Neonatal and infant mortality and morbidity increases, low birth weight babies, and of course, the maternal mortality morbidity increases because of various these infections and lower immunity. Next slide, please. So what are the important nutrients? The macronutrients we know, carbohydrate, fats, and proteins, and of course, fiber and for uh, hydration water. Micronutrients, there are many. I have included only few. Folic acid, iron, iodine, calcium, zinc, copper, selenium, magnesium, vitamin A, D, K, and other minerals. Next slide, please. So nutritional requirements, if you say, talk of macronutrients, most important is carbohydrate. And dietary carbohydrate is broken down to form glucose. We all know there are simple, carb simple carbohydrates and complex carbohydrates. And the recommended daily allowance for the carbohydrate during pregnancy is 175 gram per day. Carbohydrate and protein ratio should be adequate to avoid decrease in the gestational weight gain. Next slide, please. So there are many multiple uh, sources of carbohydrates we all know for vegetarians and non-vegetarians, whole grain, potatoes, sweet potatoes, all grains, oatmeal, cookies, whatever we are eating, they are all carbohydrates. And the junk food is main source, I think, cheese and junk food, corn, soft drinks, sweets, everything is a source of carbohydrates. And the non-vegetarian, that is meat, fish, though, along with proteins, it has got carbohydrates and seafood. Mm -hmm. Uh, what you should remember that simple and complex carbohydrates is the glycemic index when they are broken down. Next slide, please. 
Then comes the proteins. Proteins are very important. The benefits of proteins is it also gives us energy, crucial for generalized fetal and placental growth and proper digestion for the growth of maternal tissues, building of the breast and uterine tissue for support of growing baby and builds a DNA and special cells that makes up immune system. Next slide, please. So proteins provide us around 10 to 35 percent of the energy that and they our requirement is around 71 grams per day. Additionally, you can give one gram per day for first trimester, eight gram per day in second trimester and 26 grams per day in third trimester. Your recommended daily allowance is 1.1 gram to 1.2 gram per kg per day. Next slide, please. So there are various sources of proteins. Vegetarian sources are also there like seeds, grain, chickpeas, sprouts, soya, quinoa, milk and dairy products also supplies a good quality uh, proteins. So there are first class proteins. Non-vegetarian source of proteins are eggs, meat and fish. So we get protein, enough proteins. Our dals and pulses, they are also very good source of proteins, but we should take enough proteins in our diet. Next slide, please. Now, what about lipids and fats? We all know that all our A, D, E, K, these are the vitamins which are uh, lipid soluble and mother should include enough fat in her diet to meet the needs of growing baby. So there are no separate RDA for uh, fat intake during pregnancy and the recommendation remain around 20 to 35 percent of the total calories. So 8 to 14 grams per day in second trimester and 11 to 18 grams per day during third trimester. Next slide please. So essential fatty acid, these are the another, another uh, this, uh, fats one should always include. The essential fatty acid like omega-6 and omega-3, they are necessary for optimal formation of brain and eyes. And uh, around 6 to 13 grams of, uh, 13 grams of omega-6 and 1.4 gram of omega-3 per day, grams per day is required. And omega-3 fatty acid also helps in the cognitive development and prevents the allergy. Next slide, please. So these are the various sources of fats, monosaturated fats like olive oil. They are, these are the good one. Olive oil, avocado, nuts, oil, nuts, butter and ghee. Polysaturated fats, fishes, nuts, seeds, sunflower oil and mayonnaise and egg oil. These are the sources of fats which are available to us. Next, next slide, please. Role of DHA. Now, Fish eaters, it is a very rich uh, source of uh, DHA. So ocean fish, oily fish, mackerel, solomon, herring and sardine twice a weekly in the advice uh, to the pregnant woman. Tuna, swordfish should be limited because of methyl mercury content. For non-fish eaters, you, can, you have to supply around 300 to 500 milligram of omega-3 along with DHA. And it uh, does help uh, for neuronal development prevents preterm birth and preeclampsia less than 34 weeks as per the Cochrane review. Next slide, please. Now, fiber is very important for uh, prenatal diet. Pregnant women should eat uh, around 28 grams per day, modulates gut microbiome. We all know that gut uh, microbiomes are now emerging uh, treatment for many diseases. And it reduces also respiratory problems like asthma for the newborn. It reduces uh, the doctor's visits also for uh, common cold and cough. So fiber is very, very important. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as uh, all these along with the hydration, hydration is very important for digestion and uh, the, uh, it, it is a carrier. So you, uh, a pregnant woman always should eat at least eight to 10 glasses of water. Now we were, we were talking about the micronutrients. What is a micro? We talked about macro, now micro. So micronutrients belong to group three of Fredman's classification of elements. They are called micro or trace elements as their daily requirement is below 100 milligrams. And like copper, iron, zinc, chromium, cobalt, iodine, molybdenum, and selenium. What are the types of uh, micronutrients? They are divided into four categories. Water-soluble vitamins, fat-soluble vitamins, macro minerals, and trace minerals. Next slide, please. 
micronutrient deficit and pregnancy outcome we all know the folic acid folic acid in, uh, deficiency leads to many diseases uh, neural tube defect iron deficiency anemia iodine causes deficiency causes creatinism calcium is involved in uh, hyp- uh, dis- uh, if you give calcium in enough amount they say that hypertensive disorders in pregnancy zinc uh, is required as a enzyme in various enzymes anemia low birth weight and encephalitis neural tube defects vitamin a and other vitamins and many vitamins are required uh, they uh, are required in the particular amount for uh, building up of the immunity as well so these are the things we always tell the woman to have uh, enough amount please know about the anemia the global prevalence of anemia you can see uh, the india is a main main uh, so much all over world uh, there is a global prevalence and uh, india around it is uh, around 50 to 60% of the indian women are anemic next slide please so these are the consequences of iron deficiency of anemia antepartum intrapartum postpartum and fetal outcome so anemia is such a, iron is such a important molecule uh, that its deficiency is very disastrous next slide please so iron requirement uh, recommended daily allowance is around 27 mg per day we have to supplement around 60 mg per day so 10% is also only observed it is very essential for fetal growth and i have already told the deficiency what it causes maternal anemia preterm birth low birth weight babies intrapartum postpartum all complications cardiovascular risk also uh, it is noted that cardiovascular risk to the offspring during adulthood so iron deficiency anemia and the next slide is about the food she can take which is very iron rich you can advise her uh, family members to cook the food in the iron vessels so iron rich foods are nuts leafy green eggs red meat cereals legumes citrus fruits broccoli dry fruits and fish so these are the few of the iron rich food you can ask Uh, the pregnant woman to include in her diet next slide please the folic acid uh, can help to prevent birth defect known as neural tube defects like spina bifida congenital heart disease cleft lip and palate we all know that folic acid is plenty available in green leafy vegetables but if you cook the some amount of folic acid is lost so legumes tomato or range uh, the folic acid is available the recommended daily allowance is around 600 microgram per day you have to supplement every pregnant woman 400 micrograms per day during pre uh, pre conception and early pregnancy uh, next slide please second one is iodine iodine deficiency in women is around 28.5% uh, and uh, it uh, the iodine deficiency impairs the thyroid function increases abortion birth defect and perinatal mortality causes neonatal hypothyroidism growth retardation uh, hampers the brain development in the children cretinism mental impairment affects the concentration cognitive function and learning the sources are shellfish uh, vegetables fruits milk eggs and meat recommended daily allowance is around 200 micrograms per day so these are various iodine rich food uh you can ask pregnant woman uh, to include in her diet again and uh, additionally she has to include the iodine re- salt iodized salt she can crystal salt what uh, is there it has some uh, iodine so iodized uh, salt she can use in her diet next slide please so role of zinc we have, we were very much aware of this role of zinc and during corona times everybody has taken this zinc tablets so low it uh, deficiency causes low birth weight preterm birth premature rupture of membranes prolonged labor uh, then uh, increase maternal and uh, perinatal mortality next slide please so these are uh, very uh, available zinc rich foods 
Zinc is responsible for structural integrity of protein and gene expression. So daily requirement is around 12 milligram uh, per day. So nuts, mushrooms are very rich and uh, the wheat germ. So these are the very rich source of uh, um, zinc. Next slide, please. Uh, calcium. So nutritional requirement during pregnancy, the recommended daily allowance for calcium is around 1 to 1.3 gram per day. It is present in milk and milk pro products 50%, cereals 11%, vegetables 11%. So deficiency, we all know not only in preeclampsia, but we know the bone health. Bone health is entirely dependent on calcium. Along with the calcium, we should also take uh, vitamin D. Vitamin D is very important uh, for the calcium absorption and other things. And even vitamin D deficiency to uh, the increased incidences of preeclampsia. Vitamin D is also uh, required for the uh, this one iron metabolism. So vitamin D deficiency also leads to iron deficiency. Magnesium, most prenatal uh, vitamins contain only 10 to 25% of recommended daily allowance for magnesium. Vitamin C is around 60 milligram of per day. So vitamin C is also required for the absorption of iron and also uh, for the iron metabolism. Next slide, please. So vitamin A, vitamin A is around uh, 770 microgram per day. And excess vitamin A also, you should remember that you should not give more vitamin A. And as it results in liver dysfunction, you give uh, in first trimester the uh, vitamin A. In blindness in mother and uh, if in deficiency. Vidya ma'am, your voice is cracking. Vidya ma'am? Vidya ma'am, you are on mute. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, my connection got lost. Next slide, please. Yes. So these are the other vitamins and the recommended daily allowances uh, which are required during pregnancy like vitamin B vitamins. So I'll not go uh, in detail for the various recommended daily allowance, but everybody should know that these uh, things are very much required for various metabolism, growth and uh, the deficiency to prevent the deficiency disorders. Next slide, please. Hello. Yes. So this vitamin B12, I wanted to point out, is also called as cobalamin. And uh, the recommended daily allowance is around 2.6 microgram per day. Uh, it is needed to absorb iron, calcium and vitamin A. And it has got a key role in myelinogenesis, brain development and fetal growth. The formation of red blood cells and megaloblastic anemia, we know vitamin B12 deficiency. And it is involved in the metabolism of every body especially affecting DNA synthesis, fatty acid, and amino acid metabolism. We all know the folate trap and vitamin B12 deficiency uh, many times is ignored and we go on treating iron deficiency. And then at uh, one point, uh, we come to know when we check their vitamin B12 level, definitely uh, the iron deficiency gets treated once we give injection B12 uh, Next slide, please. Can you change the slide? Hello? Ma'am, slide is changed, ma'am. No, I'm not able to see only. Hi, yes. Sources? Yes, yes. So uh, these are the various sources of uh, vitamin B12.
there are animal sources plant sources fortified food sources and supplementary sources so supplementary uh, usually there are sprays and drops are available and injections are available but we can do some uh, fortification and uh, it is mainly the animal derived food the animal source and plant food do not contain vitamin b12 so when it is contaminated with some microorganism then only it is a plant source that's why the vitamin b12 is very uh, very very common in vegetarian when uh, the woman is vegetarian so we have to supplement by various fortified sources or you can give the supplementary sources next slide please hello Abhishek, can you change? Yes, yes ma'am. It is changed, ma'am. Actually, your connection is slow. That is the issue. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. I think I will go out and see. Okay, we have changed. Vitamin B12 deficiency impact on the maternal and child health care. There is increased health risk of adverse pregnancy outcome for both mother and fetus. These risks include neural tube defect, early miscarriage, preeclampsia, and fetal growth restriction. And these neuronal and developmental delays are very, very important. They are irreversible. So daily require is there during pregnancy and breastfeeding around 2.6 to 2.8 micrograms we have to supplement. Next slide, please. Abhishek, I'm not able to uh, see anything change. Ma'am, uh, so it is... Talk yeah yeah i can see now so this is about the vitamin d deficiency so a recommended daily allowance for pregnant woman is around 600 units uh, per day up to 2000 units per day in risky group and source is sunlight cod liver oil fish egg butter cheese and vitamin d is essential for maternal calcium homeostasis and fetal bone development so deficiency of vitamin d uh, leads to fetal growth restriction, preeclampsia, increased risk of caesarean preterm birth, abnormal glucose tolerant test, rickets, osteopenia, neonatal hypocalcemia. In later life, also whenever there is a vitamin D deficiency, uh, in uh, as leads to asthma, multiple sclerosis, neurological disorders, autoimmune disorders, and cardiac failure even. So severe vitamin D deficiencies uh, can lead to many complications. Next slide, please. So you should avoid raw food that we have to advise to our woman that animal-based food, raw eggs, unpasteurized milk, packaged food, you have to wash this raw fruit, vegetables to avoid food contamination, foodborne toxoplasmosis, listeriosis, which results in preterm birth, stillbirth, and fetal damage. Next slide, please. Yes. So there are a lot of things to discuss, but in uh, 15 minutes, I cannot discuss many things. The vegan diet, the people are very fond of vegan diet. And what happens is this vegan diet, we have to supplementation of iron, DHA, zinc, vitamin B12 is needed. The disadvantage of vegan diet uh, is low birth weight babies. There is increased risk of preeclampsia, inadequate brain development. So well-balanced ovo-lacto-vegetarian diet with vitamin D, folic acid, iodine, vitamin B12, iron, zinc is better. So animal protein quality is better than vegan. Next slide, please. So nutrition and lifestyle is preconception, conception, lactation has impact on optimum weight gain. Patients should have dietary counseling and diversity of the food choices, adequate exercise, they should avoid smoking and alcohol and no excess caffeine. Next slide, please. So these are the additional requirement in pregnancy and lactation. So in lactation, uh, 600 kilocalorie extra is required. Protein requirement is also increased as the vitamin, carotene, vitamin D, thiamine, riboflavin, and pyridoxine. These are the additional uh, requirement is there uh, in the lactation. Next slide, please. So nutrition during lactation. So 200 more cal kilocalories than pregnancy and these calories should come uh, from nutritious food so usually the breastfeeding woman she loses one to four pounds per month without restricting their calorie intake so these are the some of the uh, nutrients i already uh, tabulated in the previous slide next slide please so proteins uh, the woman should include uh, 
two to three servings of proteins per day. A serving is equal to three to four ounces of meat, fish, or poultry. Calcium, uh, the suggested daily intake for the breastfeeding mother is around 1,300 milligram per day. Iron, she should take 10 milligram of iron uh, per day extra. Um, means uh, the absorption is around only 10%. Next slide, please. So nutrition, uh, the vitamin C, she requires more, uh, slightly more vitamin C than they did during pregnancy, uh, around 120 milligram per day. Breastfeeding mother to take some sort of daily multivitamin, multi, um, multi-nutrients, and uh, that should contain 100% of recommended dietary allowance because the diet may not fulfill many of the micronutrients. They should drink around 8 to 10 glasses of water. And uh, the lactating mother mostly, she, uh, they should must avoid the alcohol and smoking uh, and must not use any street drugs. This is not for our country, but uh, some of the peripheral, uh, at, uh, I have seen rural uh, community people drinking alcohol also. So recommendations are promotion of proper health education to lactating mother. Social motivation is very important and introduction of nutritional education for nursing mother in syllabus. So we don't uh, give much education when we discharge the patient, whenever we talk of contraception, we talk of breastfeeding, but we never talk of any diet counseling for the nursing mother as well. The health monitoring of nursing mother is very important and supply of adequate nutrition only pre Teaching is not important. We have to take the consider family consideration also. And most important is food fortification. Iodine, iodized salt is there, like folic acid is also there. And so many other things, vitamin A is also fortification we see. So food fortification is another method of supplementation. Next slide, please. So healthy meals should include all food groups in diet, vegetables, milk, and dairy foods, cereal and grains, meat, beans, and eggs, and fats and oils. So this is a complete uh, food uh, plate for the pregnant woman. Next slide, please. So uh, the pregnant woman should consume one item daily from each of the five food groups with roti and rice. So there are pulses and other grains. Those are proteins, milk and milk products, and then eggs and meat if she's non-vegetarian, green leafy vegetables and yellow and orange pulpy fruits. So they have to prioritize these food groups from the recommended groups. So there are nutritional checklists which are available. We can uh, take the help of them. We can paste in front of our uh, clinics and we have to explain at least you have to spend 10 to 15 minutes for counseling and advising the nutrition part to every pregnant woman. So we have to help the mother and as well as family identify the locally available sources, specific nutrient rich food to include in her diet. Next slide, please. So this is a simple eat well plate, which shows the fruits and vegetables. So all the groups have been included and every time they have to take one uh, one item from each uh, part and that completes the plate uh, uh, overall. Next slide, please. So conclusion is healthy mother can ensure proper nutrition to the baby. So uh, the baby is fully dependent on breast milk during first six months of life. So we have to think of what nutrients the baby is also getting. The health of a nursing mother must be given the utmost importance to make a healthy society in future. Next slide, please. So thank you for the patient listening. I know that I have not uh, covered each and every micronutrient because uh, of the paucity of time. So thank you very much again. And uh, I think uh, some justice I could give for the micro and micronutrients. As thank you, madam. It was elaborate to know what much you need and what are the most important things. And it really, it was like, you know, recalling the olden days. So it was a good recap for all of us. And thank you once again. Any, any discussion now or later on, Monica, or just on the chat box? I would like to answer any questions are there or you can put in the chat box. I'll put the answers there. Okay. Okay, ma'am. I think we can move on to the next session. Which in my...
I don't know if Monica is there. Monica, ma'am, slide is on the screen. Hello? Mm. Monica, I think you can take over. We welcome you to the second session, that is the breastfeeding in preterm infants. Our chairpersons for today's session is Dr. Uma Shankar sir and Dr. Agvendra Prasad sir. Can I have the first slide, please? Uma Shankar sir uh, has a diploma in, uh, from, in IDS from Kiel University, Germany. He's an endoscopic surgeon and holds a diploma in cosmetic gynecology. He's a clinical head and infertility specialist at Ahilya Nursing Home and Ahilya Hospital, Guntur, and the Sri Ahilya Hospital, Vijayawada, at Andhra Pradesh. He has been the secretary of uh, the Guntur OBGY Society, joint secretary of the Andhra Pradesh OBGY Societies, and executive member of AP ISAR. We welcome you, sir. He has won many awards. The previous slide, please, Abhishek. He has won many awards, including the Jageshwari Mitra National Award for the Best Poster Presentation in Cochin and the Indian Great Leader Award in the year 2016-17. Can I have the next slide, please? Dr. Raghavendra Prasad, sir, is the Director of uh, Infertility and Fetal Maternal Unit Sunrise Hospital. He is also the Executive Director uh, in ARMC IVF Magnum. We welcome both of you to please conduct this session. This talk is by none other than Dr. Chinmay Rathamalam on breastfeeding in preterm infants. Uh, thank you. Can I uh, can I share my screen? I will only introduce you, ma'am. No, it's okay. That's okay. Don't worry. Let me just give me that time to speak. So I'll just can I just share my screen, please? Definitely, ma'am. Abhishek, please allow, ma'am. Yeah, at the outset, I really thank uh, Dr. Priyanko Roy uh, and uh, the whole committee for uh, giving us this opportunity of getting together to discuss some important issues in nutrition. It's always a pleasure to see all our seniors. Shekran sir, good evening. Palani Appan sir, good evening. And all uh, Bharti madam, Gigi madam, it's really nice to see all of you here. And we've actually interacted uh, on, on this topic some time back. And we also discussed the importance of breastfeeding in general and specifically for premature infants. And it has been a real learning experience for me preparing this topic that, you know, many uh, things that we overlook as obstetricians has come to the fore again because things are changing in the neonatology scenario. I knew Palani Appan sir will be here, although I don't see him right now. So I added one of the slides, which comes uh, completely, you know, dedicated to sir, that breastfeeding creates strong people. You know, that message has gone straight and clear to all of us because both Bahubali and Palal, they were very strong because they started with, you know, some strong breast milk. And this is why we know the advantages of breast milk, which is nutritional, immunological, and neurologically superior to any kind of breast substitutes. And uh, the last time we were uh, in a meeting about breastfeeding, we had uh, our counterparts from the Indian Academy of Pediatrics, and they made it so clear that IAP has completely made it impossible for any milk substitute company to be sponsoring any academic event because... That is how much they, they want to stay away from the substitute products. But over the last few decades, we have started looking at breastfeeding of the premature infant. We already know that breastfeeding is important for the term infant. But for the premature infant, especially the ones with low birth weight, how can breastfeed be uh, you know initiated and why is it advantageous is what is the remit of the talk today. So we know that even small changes in the prevalence of breastfeeding can become bring significant changes in the outcome of premature babies. And therefore, indirectly, it affects the healthcare costs, the economic productivity, and 
it it becomes a very satisfying experience for the mothers and of course very advantageous for the preterm baby so we have a lot of evidence that definitely maternal breastfeed helps the preterm infant but for some reason the incidence of breastfeeding of the premature is extremely low like shekharan sir told us we just hand over a premature baby to the nicu and we think that we've done a great service but we don't look into the fact that just like the mother's womb is the best incubator for the baby the mother's milk is the best feeding that can be given to the baby so preterm infants have somehow been shown to have shorter breast milk feeding as compared to term infants because of many many factors but we should not forget that even a preterm baby can benefit from breast feeding because the breast milk is actually easier to digest it is tolerated better and it has got lipases which help in the digestion it has distinct anti infective and anti inflammatory properties it it builds up the immunity of that child and there there is no two thoughts that the initial initiation of the immunological process begins with that the premature babies who've been breastfed have better vision uh, because of the fatty acid contents of that and they over long term studies have shown almost an 8.3 points higher um, iq levels than the ones which were formula fed so the hormones and enzymes that are present in the human milk are very useful in the maturation of the brain stem and the overall neuro development one of the most important features that we must remember is the bonding the emotional bonding between the mother and the child so the modeling of cost effectiveness of human milk and breastfeeding in preterm infants this this became the reason of a big study and they outrightly st stated that the health benefits of providing human milk to preterm infants has completely you know it has not been uh, studied in that much detail but it could be a real approach that could change the way premature healthcare delivery is looked upon so there are some distinct differences between a preterm milk and a donor milk when the mother gives her own milk it is fresh it contains more antibodies and more nutrients like protein sodium uh, we just heard about micronutrients from madam and they all these contents are more in a direct breastfeed of the mother when we use donor milk we may substitute some degree of this goodness but it is always pasteurized and that does not allow the amount of you know immunological competence to be transferred to the baby why is breast milk in the premature such a problem i mean we are all mammals and we we should think that you know using our mammary glands and feeding our babies is something that should come as a natural instinct in term babies it does come but what is the bigger hindrance in preterm babies one of the biggest reason is you know that bonding between the mother and the child does not happen exactly the way it happens in term babies because a premature baby is separated from the mother early looks very different and when it starts to feed the kind of response that it gives is different from that of a term baby and mothers are not really used to this response in addition to that there are some units which kind of discourage mothers from handling very small babies and they they have these uh, fixed thought processes that before a certain gestational age a baby cannot uh, um, you know tolerate oral feeds and all this leads to a lot of you know um a disparity in the uh, supply demand and even the acceptance of this concept of preterm baby being fed by the mother now research has shown that infants maintain their physiological status even when they are breastfed at 27 weeks uh, of gestation so even at that gestation there are advantages to breastfeeding and this was a big cohort study the mosaic cohort where they said that if you apply the right mindset if you apply the right instructive models you will be able to achieve a very high rate of breastfeeding for even small babies so it is mostly the uh, a defect in the method of you know information transfer from the healthcare provider to the mother that there is a hindrance in establishing breastfeeding for premature babies so they came off with these kind of data that you know just being close to the baby the staff being supportive to the mother making the mother feel enabled giving family space, spaces in the um, nicus keeping the mother and child more in contact with each other will help in you know enabling them to breastfeed
now uh, you know um, understood very closely and just physical skin to skin contact of the mother to the child gives the baby physiological warmth and it also increases that closeness which allows the mother to have better breast milk secretion and it makes the mother confident that she can handle her child and increases the milk volume in the mother the opportunity to feed the babies are frequent and early and this is a very very good intervention in terms of increasing premature baby breastfeeding rates. One should not forget that a premature birth is always an accidental delivery. It was never a planned delivery. People don't plan for premature births. They don't plan to have premature infants. So when they have one, it, they are in some kind of shock. And at that time, even before that delivery is undertaken, suppose you are planning a premature delivery, you have what is called the neonatologist counseling. Now the neonatologist counseling is always concentrated on what is going to be the respiratory outcome, what is going to be the neurological outcome, how long will with NICU stay be. But that is the opportunity where they also have to prepare the mother that, you know, you'll have a baby who's very small, who may not be that responsive, but at the same time, you will have to make uh, allocation for breastfeeding. There can be a lactational consultant which is involved at that point. They can be given leaflets and videos of what it takes to breastfeed a premature baby and that can help them prepare for the whole concept so babies which are more than 30 uh, weeks or more than 1500 grams they are they are competent to even breastfeed one to two hours after birth and if they are not ready then express breast milk can be given to them because at that gestation, that milk will be sufficient for them even without need for extra supplements. Nature has designed it in a way that the colostrum, which comes immediately after delivery, is very concentrated and has more of immunological factors. Nutrients and antibodies are concentrated in the colostrum. The four milk is a little thin. It is more watery. It helps the baby hydrate itself, but it doesn't give enough calories. And it is the hind milk which gives a lot of calories. So in a preterm baby the mother is also preterm so it takes a while for that expression to be settled so what is uh, advice to the mother a preterm uh, mother is that she has to express longer 10 to 15 minutes longer and then if if it's not enough she can do it in the nights she can do it repeatedly so that there is enough of uh, hind milk that comes into the uh, uh, express bottle and can be given to the baby. There are advantages to this, but it's very important to maintain hygiene whenever we are talking about expressed breast milk. So when the premature baby is ready, but not for direct breast uh, feeding, then the same breast milk can be given in, you know, either with a bottle with a very soft uh, nipple or with a technique that is very common in India called the Paladay feed. So Paladay is something like this Aladdin's lamp, which looks very uh, similar to that. It has a long nozzle. It minimizes the spill and it is a very hygienic method of giving the milk to the baby very physiological because the baby just gets it at its tip and then it develops its own uh, solo and suckle method so feeding on demand is what is recommended if the baby is more than 1500 grams of course it's easier because their sucking swallowing everything seems to be more synchronous but otherwise at every stage of gestation the babies develop a different level of muscular coordination and nowadays there are methods of supporting mothers through this time and helping them get the baby to latch on to the correct position and suckle for the right amount of time so that physiological breastfeeding takes over Sometimes the breast may be very dry. There may not be enough milk. Okay, we will give some form of replacement there. But the new concept in neonatology is even small drops, you know, little drops cause this magic. So they call it the oral, uh, you know, uh, mucosal therapy where smear the oral mucosa with the mother's drops of mother's milk which can escalate the immunity of the baby so in the golden hour management colostrum drops are added even if one drop paint the buccal mucosa with that colostrum painting is a good method of you know uh, synchronizing the biomes of the mother and the baby and this is something that has come up new and that is uh, uh, something which we have to think about when we are dealing with premature infants. The other thing is nursing supplements, not only premature infants, this has been used for, you know, mothers who've actually had the babies with the help of surrogates so that if their own breast is dry, they can use 
uh, these kind of nursing supplementers as aids to breastfeeding. You see there, there is a little pipe which brings in the actual, um, you know, the milk that the baby has to have, but it, the baby suckles like a natural process because that process and that bonding and that a whole, you know, uh, exercise is extremely important for us to continue as what we call as normal sane mammals because somewhere down the line, our evolutionary requirement is to feed our babies. The positions that are used for premature babies will be anything like cross cradle, cradle or even the football position. The side lying position is not one of the recommended methods for uh, premature babies. They are very small and for obvious reasons, one would be safer if we are holding them in the other positions there. So uh, we now have enough um, evidence to say that, you know, all kinds of problems that are more in premature babies can be mitigated if they have an additional advantage of having the mother's milk in that period of evolving into a better weight baby. And neurological, respiratory, metabolic, GI, all kinds of issues that we face with premature babies will be better handled if the baby is breastfed instead of formula fed. So how to improve the maternal response? These mothers who are so vulnerable because their babies are so vulnerable, one has to talk to them, give them constant positive motivation, tell them that the baby's appearance is something which will change eventually. They can see photos of babies who have serially grown in that NICU. The the staff can have a very, very strong motivating role for the mother. Let the mother spend more time with the baby. Name the baby. That helps, you know, instead of giving that bed number, name the baby something so that the baby mother has a direct connect with the baby. And with all these things, let us try and promote breastfeeding because we know that breastfeeding creates strong babies. And in the premature babies, we need a lot of development that has been, you know, suddenly made ex utero, which was supposed to be in utero. So when we are trying to make the ex utero environment, as physiological as possible, then the nutritional supplement also should come from a physiological source like the mother's breast milk. Whatever supplements are required, the doctors will definitely advise, but let it come through the normal proper channel because with a good nutrition at that point in time, we will be building a very healthy future. Thank you very much for a very patient hearing. Thank you, ma'am. Raghavendra sir, are you there? Uh, yes, I am here. Yes, yes. Sir, sir can you please uh, conclude Madam's talk? As chairperson, sir? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it was... The, the talk was actually very brisk. It, Madam finished it very fast. But anyway, uh, it is a very apt topic because breastfeeding, especially when you have uh, preterm neonates it's something uh, which as gynecologists we are not much aware of uh, we always leave it to the pediatrician side to take over and we don't look at it at all so thank you ma'am for enlightening en enlightening us on this particular uh, thing which is a very common thing on uh, in uh, in everybody's uh, practice and uh, can we have questions now Please. I think Shekran sir had told this in his initial remarks that, you know, we just hand over the preterm baby to the neonatologist and we think that our job is done. And actually, many of the times we kind of uh, like think the buck stops there. But uh, so many things are changing that I think we also need to talk to the neonatologist every time. Because another point which they brought about when I was discussing this with them is that the stopping policy. When do you stop uh, you know, uh, formula feeding or uh, any kind of uh, supplemental feed to the baby. That also varies when the consultants change. So most of the good NICUs now have a protocol where it is a unit-based policy. So encouraging breastfeeding or discouraging breastfeeding or adding formula or adding supplement is no more an individual consultant decision. It's a unit decision so that anytime the patient comes, the same story is told to them because that's also something which is very important. Yeah, that is what we commonly see, madam, because even in our hospital, once the delivery is done, 
then any question regarding they open their mouth and ask for feed then i said ask the pediatrician <laughs> <laughs> that is what we basically do i don't and know you even ask the with dry breast you know that was a learning point for me that even with dry breast even few uh, drops of colostrum we can uh, smear it on the buccal mucus and that has an advantage so there is no harm in letting human mother hold a human baby and allow it to suck <laughs> whatever it gets because that's where the whole concept comes from Sure. Any other questions? I think Dr. Basil has written there. There's a common notion that growth restricted babies stress more on breastfeeding and hence formula feeds are better. No, they don't agree to that. The point is this whole method of feeding directly from the mother helps in the bonding of the uh, mother and the baby. As as for the caloric requirements, those kind of supplements. Required. If they are growth, growth restricted, that will be required. But the basic suckling process, I don't think that adds to any problem. The synchronization of the suckling and swallowing, that is a natural um, process. If we continue to do it, then the babies will develop their own reflex. Otherwise, that reflex will remain undeveloped. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you for answering all the questions. Uh, thank you, Vidya ma'am and Shumai ma'am for accepting our invitation and presenting such elaborate talk that nobody has more doubts ma'am. Thank you, Gigi ma'am and uh, thank you, Raghavendra sir for being chairpersons for these two academic sessions. I now request Dr. Shatabdi to please take over and conduct the panel discussion. Thank you, Monica. Uh, thank you, Vidya ma'am. Thank you, Chinmay ma'am. Indeed, it is always wonderful to listen to you all talking. We'll move on to our next session. Our next session is a panel discussion on case-wise approach to anemia, a day-to-day -day thing that we see in our daily practice. Our moderators for the session are Dr. Bharti Rajeshekhar, ma'am, and Dr. Rajeshri Palladi, ma'am. And our expert is Dr. Umail Murugesan, ma'am. Can we have the slides, please? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Bharti, ma'am, is the medical director and OBGY consultant at Sayadri Multi Speciality Hospital, Hassan. She's also the South Zone coordinator for the Public Awareness Committee of Foxy. She's the president-elect of Kasoga. Uh, she is also uh, the uh, Hassan director of the Indian Red Cross and she has been the IMA state past vice president. Uh, welcome, Bharti, ma'am. Our next moderator is Dr. Rajeshri Paladi, ma'am. Uh, ma'am is the Honorable Secretary of the Karnataka State uh, OBGY Association. She is the Dean of Research at KBN University. She is the member of Academic Council of KBN University, also the member of IQ IQAC and the professor in the department of OBGY at Kalaburagi. Uh, she has organized various conferences and has various awards to her credit. Welcome, Rajeshri, ma'am. Our expert for the session is Dr. Umail Murugesan, ma'am. Ma'am is a consultant at Sri Kumaran, a specialty hospital. Uh, ma'am has a diploma in OBS and gynecology from RSRM Stanley Medical College, also MD from Stanley Medical College. She has been the IMA treasurer at Tambaram, IMA secretary, IMA vice president, as well as the president of Tambaram. She is the founder member of Tambaram OG, OG Forum. Uh, welcome, Umail, ma'am. We have a, a very, uh, very prestigious list of panelists over here. Our first panelist is Dr. Sri Harsha Ravuri. Can we have the slides, please? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Shri Harsha is a clinical director at Birth Health Fertility Center at Guntur. She's presented papers at state, national, and international conferences. She's also received the Best Paper Presentation Special Award at APCOG 2019. Uh, welcome, Dr. Shri Harsha Ravuri. Our next panelist is Dr. Basil Matthews. He is a consultant and head of Department of Fetal Medicine at Daya General Hospital, Trishur. His areas of interest are fetal interventions and maternal fetal medicine. Welcome, Dr. Basil. Our next panelist is Dr. Annapurna Dhanu. Ma'am is a consultant OBGY at Sangameshwar Hospital, Gadag. Uh, she is an FMAS in World Laparoscopy from Ho World Laparoscopy Hospital, Gurgaon, and presently pursuing the RGUHS Fellowship in Fetal Medicine at GIMS Gadag and Secretary of the Gadag OBGY Society. Welcome, Dr. Annapurna. Our next panelist is Dr. K. Purushottam, sir. Sir is the Associate Professor in OBGY at RVM Medical College, College near Siddipet TS. He is the General Secretary of WOGS as well as the President of WOGS as well as the Joint Secretary at TCOG and has been the examiner at various universities. Welcome, sir. Our next panelist is Dr. Anit Kumar. Dr. Anit Kumar uh, has a fellowship in reproductive medicine. He's also completed his MRCOG. He's a diploma holder in reproductive medicine from Kiel, Germany. 
also has the andrology certification from Cleveland Clear Clinic, USA. Uh, welcome, Dr. Anit. Our next panelist is Dr. Sarita Bhadwade, ma'am. Ma'am is the associate professor at OBG Brims Bidar, consultant at Bhadwade Hospital Bidar, also the president of the OBGY Society of Bidar and has been the past vice president of IMA Bidar. Welcome, Sarita, ma'am. Our next panelist is Dr. Nirmala Devi Bachoti. Uh, Ma'am has been the past secretary of EOGS. She is a practicing consultant at Sri Kanaka Lakshmi Hospital, Eluru, as well as the present president of Eluru Obsgynec Society. She has various awards to her credit, including the Excellence Awardee by Healthcare International Hyderabad in 2007. Welcome, Nirmala Ma'am. Our next panelist is Dr. Rekha Rajesh. Uh, Ma'am is a certified high-risk pregnancy specialist as well as holds a diploma in reproductive medicine. She is the clinical director of Vijay Srishti Fertility Center, Hosur at Krishnagiri and Tirupati. And as well as the director of uh, Mathurutva Fertility Center, Tirupati and Nellore. Welcome, Rekha, ma'am. Our next panelist is Dr. Sushma. Uh, Dr. Sushma is a consultant uh, obsgyni specialist at Mahalakshmi Manjapa Multi-Speciality Hospital and Research Institute, Hassan. Secretary of the Hassan Society of Obs and Gynecology. Uh, she has various international and national publications to her credit. Welcome, Dr. Sushma. Thank you. Yeah, uh, our next panelist is Dr. S. Sundar Narayan, sir. Sir is a gynecologist and fertility specialist at SS Fertility Center, Nagarkoil. He is a course director for the postdoctoral fellowship in gynae endoscopy at Dr. MGR Medical University, as well as the president of the Nagarkoil OBGY Society. Welcome, sir. I now hand over the dice to Bharati ma'am and Rajeshri ma'am to carry out the panel discussion. Looking forward to a great discussion. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sathabdi, for that uh, introduction of this very, very um, high, uh, highly academic uh, panel. And I think Dr. Rajeshri Paladi was not doing well. She may not uh, uh, be in the co-moderating, but however, as soon as she joins, uh, she will be co-moderating with me. And I thank Dr. Priyanku Roy and the entire Foxy uh, PAC team for giving us the opportunity to talk on one of these very important uh, common issues in our day-to-day -day practice, which is contributing to an increased incidence of maternal and neonatal and infant mortality and morbidity. And uh, I have my apologies to my panelists. Uh, I was traveling, I was out of the country and hence I could not share the full edited uh, panel because of my, I was quite busy and I just came back on Sunday and there was a jet lag. So I was in a hurry and I'm sorry, but I'm a little unprepared for this uh, panel. But however, I'm sure all of you are well read and I am going to be putting across only scenarios which we face in our day-to-day -day practice, especially in the uh, parts of our country and the optimum management, I think most of you will be able to elaborate to our delegates. So without wasting much time, let us, I think I seek permission to uh, share my screen. And y yes, Dr. You can. Dr. Umayal can uh, contribute, Madam, she's there as an expert, so she can contribute whenever the need arises. And madam, your opinions and your uh, um, participation is well appreciated. So are my slides visible? Uh, yes, ma'am, visible. Just yeah. make it full screen. Oh, yeah, 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 just give me a moment. Yes? Yes, ma'am, perfect. Fine, great. So um, Dr. Satapi, uh, could you please tell me how much time we would have because it just says 5 p.m. onwards. So we can mod we can moderate it according to that. The time for the panel. And once again, a welcome to my co-moderators, my expert and my dear panelists and the entire team. Well, we all know that anemia is a very prevalent disease across age and gender and has increased considerably among children, pregnant women and men, according to the data in the oh NFS 520. Ah. Yes? somebody saying something? Well, it's the commonest medical disorder in pregnancy that we come across um, preceding thyroid diseases and hypertensive disease of pregnancies. And we all know that about 80 to 20 pregnant women are anemic in developed countries as compared to as high as 40 to 75% in developing countries. And it is responsible for significant high maternal and fetal mortality all over the world. So let us not, not go into the facts and figures because we are all aware of that. And we know that the 
low mid, uh, low middle and income income countries especially the southeast asia has an alarming incidence of almost as high as 50% along with the afro asian countries and in india well we you know that it is almost 50% contributing to the global maternal deaths are due to anemia and 80% of this is occurring in india prevalence of anemia in india decreased marginally to from 58% to 50% in the nfhs four survey we have a long way to go and 58% lactating females in india are women because of their poor awareness on the nutrition what they are supposed to do and we have just heard dr vidya to be giving us an excellent lecture about what is optimum nutrition for our to be mothers mothers and the um, um, lactating women so well we are we have an armament we have a full panel from all over the south of the country and i think most of the states we have a similar instance as we have in karnataka so just to set the ball rolling i will just put uh, put in a little basics so i would now ask i am going to put the questions randomly and if anybody wants to you know, add on i would request you to kindly raise your hands so we could take give you the option to give your opinions too so see harsha Uh, well, I'm just going according to the order which is in the brochure. Dr. Sinharsha, could you just briefly define anemia? Sinharsha, are you there? Dr. Sushma, you can take the question. If Sinharsha is not there, ma'am, uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, um, anemia in pregnancy is defined as first trimester hemoglobin less than 11 gram per deciliter and second and third trimester hemoglobin less than. Uh, 10.5 gram per deciliter, and in postpartum, less than 11, uh, less than 10 is also considered as anemia. Yeah. So the WHO and the CDC have the cutoff line at about 11 to 11.5. So, what are the causes of anemia, Dr. Sarita, Madam? Could you just uh, take the question? This is just to start the session, and then we we case scenarios. Dr. Anybody, Dr. Purushottam, Dr. Anit, Dr. Basil. Any of you could questions, please? Good evening, madam. Causes yes. of anemia can be there may be uh, uh, the fault in uh, intake of the nutritional intake, and it, there may be absorption problem, or there may be patient may be having some hemorrhage, like she may be having menorrhagia or worm infestations or piles. So she may be having some chronic infection like tuberculosis, or uh, there may be she may be a typhoid carrier. so all these things have to be ruled out before we go for to treat the anemia yes, thank you dr sarita and as you all you know that pregnancy itself causes a amount of physiological anemia because of the um, hemodilution and then of course the associated uh, decreased uh, intake increased output and i mean increased demand and an increased loss of any rbc from any site in the body could contribute to the anemias in pregnancy So quickly, could Dr. Anit uh, tell us what are the types of anemia we could come across in pregnancy? Dr. Anit or Dr. Pushottam? Anybody? Any of the panelists? Anupurna. Mm -hmm. uh, Ma'am, it is the uh, the nutritional anemia. Then there is something called physiological anemia, which happens especially in pregnancy. Then uh, then comes all those uh, blood loss anemia. And uh, factor deficiency anemia, and uh, uh, yeah, and erythropoietin deficiency anemia. Yeah. So basically, we have the iron deficiency anemia, which is the commonest, probably due to nutrition, and the other one is the B12 and the folic acid uh, deficiency anemias, which Dr. Vidya Tobi was bringing out because of the faulty dietary uh, factors. It is a very very common scenario, which is very often overlooked. in our clinical scenario we are just addressing the iron deficiency and of course we have the hemorrhagic anemias and we have the hemolytic anemias which could be the congenital sickle cell anemias and the hemoglobinopathies like thalassemia which is a quite a common condition in our region and we need to keep our mind and our eyes open to this uh, thalassemia in all our antenatal and to be mothers i would say thank you so as you all know the iron requirements in pregnancy are definitely increased let's not go through these basics so so how do we classify the severity of anemia could uh, dr nirmala or dr rekha take the question 
or Dr. Pushottam. I don't see the other panelists here. The minute is less than seven. Namaste. Yes, ma'am, please. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Ma Less than seven grams uh, of HB is severe anemia in uh, pregnancy, ma'am. So, oh, my, uh, yeah. 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 Um, mild is nine to ten point nine, and moderate is seven point eight to seven uh, nine, and severe is less than seven, ma'am. Very severe is less than four, which is uh, non compensable. So we classify anemia 1 according to the hemoglobin concentration. And of course, once we get the peripheral smear, we can also classify them according to the type of anemia, whether it is megaloblastic anemia, iron deficiency anemia, or any of the uh, inherited uh, hemoglobinopathies or sickle cell disease. So let's come into a case scenario. We have a primary patient which is referred to a tertiary center at 14 weeks of gestation with a hemoglobin of 7 grams per cent. So what would be your approach for diagnosis, Dr. Purushottam or Dr. Sundar Narayan? Dr. Anit Kumar? Ma'am, first we should... Uh... Yes, Dr. Basil Matthews or anybody in the panel, please. Yeah, ma'am. First, uh, first will be like we'll be seeing uh, what exactly is the reason behind this. So you'll look into the history, and uh, does she have any history of uh, previous bleeding disorders? Suggest your previous uh, bleeding disorders. Any warm infestation? Family? I mean, in the family, someone else is uh, having any similar uh, complaints, and are there any kids along? Then does she have any problems associated with the severity of the anemia? Like she has any tiredness, breathlessness, palpitation, uh, or any other uh, uh, like factors? And then uh, the last would be any chronic illness if she's suffering from. So that might contribute to any history of any previous uh, chemotherapy or cancers. So all this might contribute and even surgeries for that matter. Liver disorders or not. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Basil. As you said, we go by the etiological factors and we'll have to take elicit all these in the history because she's a primary, she's quite early in pregnancy and her hemoglobin is quite low. So we have to look into any other pre-existing conditions and that's why a detailed history is of utmost importance. Dr. Umayal, as an expert, would you like to contribute to anything else for the panel so far? Dr. Umayal, are you there? Anyway, let's go ahead. So once the history has been taken, well, this is, all of us know that she has, she's got pallor. She, her color and shape of the nails were normal. She's got a pale, bald tongue. She doesn't have any jaundice. There's no splenomegaly or pedal edema in this particular. So what are the investigations you would like to do? Dr. Sundar Narayan, Dr. Rekha, anybody, please, one of you could take the questions because I see that few of panelists are missing. Dr. Anit Kumar? the complete uh, blood picture and uh, from there we'll look at like what exactly the type of anemia so to to classify the type of anemia probably the serum protein and the peripheral blood smear that might help and then to assess what is the cause for anemia then you look into you know urine examination maybe um, probably stool examinations and uh, then is there any chronic factors involved or to to rule out that the rf nlft might help Thank you, Dr. Basil. So rightly, as you put it across, we have to first do the peripheral blood smear. Just getting a hemoglobin and proceeding with management, I think, is not the way we need to go forward. A peripheral blood smear is of utmost importance to classify it into the type of anemia, whether it is microcytic or megaloblastic, or does she have a sickle cell disease? And of course, then we do the basic investigations to rule out any infections, stool examination for any occult blood or helminthic infections, renal function tend to rule out chronic kidney disease, which is quite common in our country, liver function tests for any hemolytic anemias. And of course, thyroid, I think we have to be very, very um, um, pertinent in getting the thyroid test done because it is known to cause anemia in these young women and ferritin levels are, are important because it gives us a clue it gives us a clue as to what type of anemia uh, we are getting it and how we would go about managing this lady. So which two basic investigations will help you to diagnose the type of anemia Dr. Sushma? Um, ma'am, One is peripheral smear and another is serum iron profile ma'am. Uh, peripheral smear, if it is showing, uh, oh, sorry, complete blood picture and uh, peripheral smear. If peripheral smear is showing microcytic or hypochromic anemia, then we have to investigate 
ஒன் <laughs> uh these all are the symptoms ma'am and these are so similar to the symptoms of a pregnancy so that is where we yes, need yes. not just wave off her complaint to come to us and tell us that i'm tired or ngd just don't say that yeah they are pregnant you are having pregnancy you are having pregnancy and that's why because they are mimicking anemia is going to overlap the same symptoms as in pregnancy so we yes, need yes. to give a patient hearing to whatever the patient is trying to tell us rather than putting it off as a pregnancy associated symptom because they overlap in anemia and pregnancy they are going to overlap so what are the signs of anemia we have already put it across i think so now uh, dr sarita what are the effects of anemia on pregnancy the fetus as well as the mother that is why we have so much concerned about her hemoglobin status what are the so, effects of anemia the effect can be on mother and fetus as well so to mother actually during antimatter uh, pro- like problems can be during pregnancy antipartum during delivery and postpartum period so during antipartum period she is prone for uh, prom and uh, preeclampsia is very common abruptio abruption is also very common she is prone for infections also and uh, preterm delivery is uh, common in the, such patients anemic patients during delivery if uh, even a normal blood loss she will go into hemorrhagic shock so uh, even a mild amount of pph will be a dangerous to patient's uh, health and uh, she is prone uh, vulnerable for congestive cardiac failure so we have to uh, take care of uh, delivery so whenever there is immediately after delivery because there is sudden volume overload then there may it may cause uh, congestive cardiac fo- uh, failure then increased chances of operative deliveries are very common and cesarean section is common Yeah. Could you elaborate on the neonatal risks? Uh, what could be the problems with, for the neonate? So usually such uh, anemic patients, they will have small for gestational age or IUGR or low birth weight babies. And be- because of uh, preterm delivery, there will be prematurity. And uh, sometimes there may be IU- intrauterine death is uh, seen. And uh, usually baby will be having neonatal anemia and uh, infections are very common uh, like uh, after delivery. Maybe. and there's one more thing we need i think dr umayal could you or any of the panelists would, would like to add on we need to talk to them about the intelligent disabilities which the baby could have because of in utero maternal anemia dr vidya tobi was talking about this so though it has studies have shown that those women who have conceived with a hemoglobin less than 9 grams their children are intellectually compromised because of i mean iron deficiency anemia they may be having memory and processing disorders as well as intellectual disabilities i think that is how that's a very good point to put across to the parents so that they get their hemoglobin on track with the optimum management that we advise because very often they do not listen to us when we tell them that they need parental iron the hemoglobin has to be increased they will say i will take beetroot i will take this i will take dates i will increase it without any medication so this i think this point when you tell them that it could hamper their intellectual intellectual ability of your child it goes well into them to correct their anemia as early as possible so dr sarita has well uh, put across all the complications in the antepartum and the intrapartum delivery of course postpartum they could have pph subinolution failed lactation congestive cardiac failure and postpartum depression and cardiomyopathy and fetal complications have also been also been put across so what will be the line of treatment for this uh, particular lady i would request all the panelists to give me their opinion and the expert dr omayal to also opine on this dr anit kumar dr Nir, you can take this 
So, uh, as with any patient, we like to start them on oral iron. Probably I'll add on uh, vitamin C along with the oral iron, and you know, see if it is improves within a period of two to three weeks. And if it is not improving, probably counsel them for uh, you know IV iron sucrose or uh, ferric carboxymaltose, whichever patient is affordable, and then go ahead accordingly. Dr. Nirmala, madam, you would like to add on? Yes, madam. Thank you. Thank you, madam. 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 Thank you,
Okay. Yes. So that is how we have to give them. And then now we come into the uh, you this. I'm not going to either because there are various preparations of hemoglobin. But which iron preparation would you prefer to give? I would like all the panelists to opine on this. Ma'am, ferric ascorbate. Yes, I'm sure okay. everybody has their own favorites. Of exactly. <laughs> Many of them are pharma driven too. <laughs> yes. So I mean, what would you take as a criteria to give a product? Let's be practical here. And to be very honest, we, I mean, I usually ask them to collect it from the, uh, from the PHCs. So they have the persulfate preparation. So if they are intolerant to it or the iron is not uh, improving with it, then I, uh, I prescribe uh, either ascorbate or bisglycinase, depending on, um, you know, what exactly is the problem. Yes. Any other, the other panelists' opinion, please? Dr. Umayal, expert opinion, please. Well, I would say... Uh, I, 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 Yes, no, I just, please, please. Uh, so, as I said, ferric ascorbate or ferric uh, fumarate, a lot of preparations are there. I prefer, I generally used to prefer uh, these two preparations as, uh, you know, as my first line of yeah, meat as a drug. I would agree with Dr. Basil. The government of India has come up with a very good Matratva Suraksha program and the Anemia Mukta Bharat. So we could always give them the preference of taking the iron preparation which is available to them in this program. And of course, it, it, some of them may be, have, may be having gastric intolerance or their hemoglobin is not rising after six to eight weeks of therapy. I think then when we do the hemoglobin and their ferritin levels, we could then, we could think of changing the iron preparation. I think that's how we should go with. And of course, if they're not tolerant, the ferrous ascorbate or the ferrous fumarate is my favorite. And if they're not responding, we definitely have to not uh, just continue just because it's my favorite. I need to, because each woman is going to respond differently. We need to uh, decide to change the preparation or change the route of iron administration. to be So we should be guided by whether she is having intolerance or non-compliance and whether there is an increase in her hemoglobin levels with whatever preparation we are using. So what is the role of parenteral ion therapy? Parenteral ion therapy is when the patient is not responding to the, I mean, not responding, the patient is basically intolerant to the oral mainly. Uh, not responding to the oral might be because of multiple reasons. Otherwise, and when the patient is very near to the, uh... Uh, term and yes. then uh, she's still anemic moderately. You may have to go for a parental therapy. Uh, yes, madam. I think one is she is not tolerant to aural line and not responding. The second thing is she is nearer to term. I think we should go ahead with a total dose infusion of parental line so that we will be able to correct her anemia well in advance. So the iron preparations we have for oral. Uh, Parental ion therapy, I would like one of the panelists to quickly go through uh, the what are the uh, parental ion therapy you people use in your practice and any points you would like to convey to the delegates of this webinar. Dr. Annapurna? Ma'am, iron sucrose and also I use uh, ferric carboxy maltose and uh, uh, it depends on their uh, uh, how, 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 how they are affordable or not and also the severity of the anemia, ma'am. So I use ferric carboxymaltose, preferably ferric carboxymaltose and uh, uh, fer, uh, uh, iron sucrose also I use, ma'am. Yeah, Dr. Basil, Dr. Anit, Dr. Nirbala. So, yeah, I, even I yeah, also, yeah. Equip, I mean, I've completely transferred the, the practice from to you used to uh, ferric carboxymaltose now. I either prefer using a 750 milligram or a 1000 milligram dosage uh, in a single dose of... Uh, that, that, is, that treatment will be under our control and uh, doesn't need, the patient doesn't need a number of intramuscular injections. Dr. Sushma? What would you, what is your, I would, I'm just taking the general opinion so that we can give the concluding remark in the end. Dr. Sushma, Dr. Sarita. Madam, I prefer uh, uh, ferric maltose compound because it can be given uh, weekly and uh, as uh, high as 1000 milligram can be given. 
Uh, could any of the panelists, yes, iron sucrose and iron carboxymaltose are the favorites, but iron sucrose is the drug that is available in the government public sector right now in, by the government of India. So in those women, I think, who cannot afford the carboxymaltase, we always have, there is a place for iron sucrose because it's available free of cost in the public sector. And so we should not just do away with that. Only thing is it requires repeated intravenous injections. There's 100 milligrams IV over five minutes, thrice weekly. Do not give more than 200 milligrams. And of course, always do it in a hospital setup under a slow infusion. And please keep all emergency drugs in case of any anaphylaxic shock, explain to the patient and then only try to transfuse. So that does have a place there. Of course, peric, peric carboxymaltase is everybody's favorite, we would agree, because of the less toxicity. I would request any of the panelists to kindly elaborate the transfusion protocol for iron ferric carboxymaltase. Dr. Anit Kumar. Madam. Yes, anybody. Madam, it can be given up to 500 milligram weekly and uh, it should be given in 200 ml of normal saline over a period of 15 minutes. No test dose is required. It uh, actually, uh, we have not seen any uh, like reactions with this uh, uh, ferric maltose compound. So it is a single dose in weekly dose and uh, even though it is costlier, but compared to when you compare uh, 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 iron sucrose and uh, uh, this FCM, both will come to same. Only that uh, iron sucrose injections we have to give every alternate day or every day. So it is more patient will have more pricks compared to this FCM. So it is better to go for a single dose of either 500 or 1000 milligram. If patient is more than 70 kg, we can go for 1,000 milligram in one sitting. Yes, inputs from other panelists? Yeah, we have to calculate the deficient uh, hemoglobin according to the um, total uh, required uh, dose and then we have to infuse. And because there is, a, there is iron uh, overload, the toxicity is there. And uh, the precautions we need to take because there have been instances of few reports of anaphylaxis. So I think we have to be very cautious when we are transfusing carboxymaltase. Yes, yes, Dr. Basil, please go ahead. So I wanted to share that. So basically, even though when, when everybody says that it doesn't have much uh, uh, side effects, I have had one patient who developed anaphylaxis and uh, we had to manage with, with uh, you know, all those drugs. It was an emergency as well. So ever since then, I use it, but then I use it with caution and always under uh, watch, under observation. So we do have, like what I do, I do use ferric carboxymaltase. And as you said, I have had a patient with anaphylaxis. But then when we gave the adverse drug reaction to the company, it came to our notice that there are spurious drugs available. So we have to make sure that the R ferric FCM comes from a reputed company, from the stockist. That's what they told me, said, there are people selling spurious, so please be careful. And whenever we transfuse, I always put them under supervision one-to-one -one with the nurse. And we have the emergency drugs with adrenaline, ephorlin, everything in the tray there. And it is uh, diluted in 100 ml NS. And we have to make it a point that we, if it is 500 milligrams, it has to be transfused within a time span of 12 to 15 minutes. And if it is 1,000 milligrams, we have to finish the transfusion by about 15 minutes. It cannot go on like our nurses just let it like a drip irrigation going for, uh, for 35 to 45 minutes. Check the vitals before transfusion. Check the vitals post transfusion and during transfusion. Keep the woman in the hospital for another half an hour. And once she is stable, I think it is prudent that we can send her home, telling her that if at all she has any type of an uh, anaphylaxis or a rash or something, she has to report immediately to the hospital. Because we have heard one or two reports of mortality also. We don't know the exact outcome, but it could be due to some sort of a, um, anaphylaxis, which was a delayed reaction. Because there's what, there was a medical um, professional who postpartum uh, took uh, iron uh, FCM and they said the mortality was due to that. We are not sure of the reports, but so we have to be very, very careful when we use FCM. We cannot give it as a cursory injection uh, without doing proper studies I and mean, proper precautions. And the time span of transfusion is very, very important because they say that the molecule undergoes biodegradation and that can be the reason for the anaphylaxis in certain cases. Good I would uh, yes, I would like to comment. Uh, 
here actually like we all know that after the fcm has uh, come into place the management of anemia especially for our pregnant women is now uh, really like looking very uh, positive just a single dose or another one one more dose before her delivery is taking care of her anemia status what i do in my practice is like uh, i i have one bed with all the monitors and things uh, ready because almost every every day we will have one or two patient having the iron infusions and i have uh, trained my staff uh, one or two staffs who will take charge of the iron infusion patients so as soon as the so the, the we will she is in the casualty with all the gadgets necessary but all there is a reaction and as you as we were discussing the 15 minutes uh, within the 15 minutes the, the, we have to see the start time and the finish time and meticulously when we are doing it uh, and usually one of the doctors will be there in the casualty also looking into the other patients so uh, when we do this to our patients uh, i have had one experience of anaphylaxis which was identified immediately and we stopped the drug and we just gave a steroid and um, uh, monitored and she became all right just the teaching and all that and there was a slight breathlessness so we identified and we stopped the infusion but that was only one case but uh, usually the, our patients are tolerating the fcm very very well so that's what i have seen i i really keep thanking god whenever i uh, I prescribe this injection because it is a boon for all of us practicing obstetricians. Because Thank handling you. anemia in delivery is such a nightmare. So it's a, it's wonderful, but that 15 minutes should be done very meticulously. When when you do that, we we don't get even one reaction. At least in my in my personal uh, things, what I'm doing. Yeah, same uh, same here, Dr. Umayyal. I think just be prudent, be meticulous, and be alert always. And of course, you yeah. can. Expect never never take never take it for granted. Exactly. It is only FCM. I have given hundred FCMs. Ah, uh, like that. Only then mistakes will happen. Each and every FCM for that patient is very very important. Yeah. We have another molecule on the on the block, which is iron isomaltose, which is also being used. And uh, we are proud to say that our own Dr. Maman um, Murthyjay Belladin. Uh, Uh, belgam a professor in belgam medical college they are doing a study compared to study between isomaltos and fcm and they say that even this single dose infusion is being given uh, better good results and the advantage is ism the price is a uh, fairly less than fcm so let's skip this well what are the contraindications well we, you all know any allergies liver cirrhosis arthritis or acute renal failure we are not going to give them and Initially, some of the side effects they may have. Could Dr. Sushma just elaborate? Minor side effects uh, may be there in women who do uh, get HCM. So no, have... yes, Dr. My reactions like allergic reactions and then uh, side major anaphylactic shock. No. Yeah, other than that, sometimes they complain of headache, a slight breathlessness, dyspnea. We need to monitor them and see that they are stable before we. Uh, shift them and another tip i would like to say especially if your pregnancy woman is around 30 weeks or 32 weeks supine hypotension is going to be common so make it a point that when the transfusion is there please put them in the left lat position or just give them a left tilt before when you put them on this even though it's just for a 15 minute uh, shot so what are the indications of blood transfusion dr anapurna dr Be any of the panels dr basil Mm -hmm. Yeah, any any hemor in any hemorrhage during pregnancy like threatened abortion, APH, um, uh, or any other uh, source of uh, bleeding like uh, which is uh, causing a uh, lot of anemia. So uh, these are the indications. Mostly chronic anemias are overlapped by the acute conditions like hemorrhage. and uh, when the patient is symptomatic even with moderate anemia and uh, even with moderate anemia patient uh, uh, has uh, any other uh, uh, iatrogenic uh, injuries or uh, going for uh, operative delivery like cesarean section or uh, any other reasons of uh, dac uh, all these are uh, indications for blood transfusion
ಮತ್ತೆ ಅನ್ಯೂಟ್ ಯುವರ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಮ್ಯಾಮ್ ಮ್ಯಾಮ್ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಅನ್ಯೂಟ್ ಯುವರ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಭಾರತಿ ಮ್ಯಾಮ್ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಅನ್ಯೂಟ್ ಯುವರ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಮ್ಯಾಮ್ I'm sorry. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, well, uh, that is well, uh, blood, the scope of blood transfusion is very limited in today's scenario, I would say. Let me go back to my slide. Yeah. So now we go to the case number two. Yeah, this investigation and ferritin, I think we've already gone through, so I'm not going to go back to that. Yeah. So we have a, the, the next case is a primary patient referred to a tertiary care center. Uh, here I mean tertiary care means a medical college because sometimes in the primary health center or a smaller uh, PHC, they do not have the facilities. So it's not that they go to a high-end hospital. They just refer to the medical college. At 32 weeks gestation with a hemoglobin of 7 grams, she had no improvement after two courses of parental ion therapy. So that was the reason she was referred because she was not responding. So, Dr. Annapurna, what would you think of in such cases? Ma'am, uh, uh, we should uh, think of uh, hemoglobinopathies. Like? Or, uh, uh, like ma'am, uh, telesmia, mm -hmm. yeah. as she is a primary. And uh, she, she is a referred case and uh, chronic uh, nutritional, uh, and nutritional uh, anemia, ma'am. Uh, anybody else? It could be B12 deficiency also. B12, yeah. yeah for for lick acid and B12. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Uma Shankar here. If he is there, sir, could you give your opinion? Well... The point here is we have to, what investigation, so to identify the type of anemia, what would the investigations you would ask for this for this woman? Dr. Sarita, Dr. Basil. First, we'll go for a complete blood picture, madam, peripheral smear, so to know the type of anemia. Because... Yes. Dr. Basil. First, we have to know the cause of anemia, madam. Analyze what is the cause of anemia. So, for that, we have to do CBP and uh, peripheral smears so that we will come to know whether it is iron deficiency anemia or folic acid uh, deficiency. So, if she is having folic acid deficiency, so we are giving only iron preparation, so she, is, uh, she will not respond. So, then we have to supplement uh, folic acid along with that. And uh, vitamin A, C and zinc, T also has to be given. So dietary supplement. So what are the investigations you would do? The first would be peripheral smear and uh, complete blood picture. Complete blood picture will give an idea towards what type, whether it is a macrocytic or a microcytic, those both in the peripheral blood smear as well as in the complete blood picture. And then comes the serum ferritin. Serum ferritin will give an idea. If it is less, it is uh, natural less than 30 or so. If it will be like uh, 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 clue towards iron deficiency. If it is more than 30, then you'll have to think about whether she's having an infection per se at person, chronic infection. If it is not there, then probably it might not be a iron deficiency anemia. Then when you look at the complete blood picture, uh, depending on the MCV and MCH, that will also guide you. Like let's say it is less than 25 and uh, less than 75, somewhere around that. Then it might uh, give a clue towards it might be a thalassemic kind of picture and RDW also. If RDW is increased, it might be like an you know, IDC. It is less than probably would be a thalassemic kind of picture. So if you're thinking that comes, then uh, probably you have to do a microprocess process or a liquid chromatography. So basically, we have to keep our mind open for the myeloblastic anemias due to B12 and folic acid deficiency, the thalassemias, which are quite common in our uh, pregnant women. So then these studies, that is the spectrophotometry, the uh, ferritin levels, the retic count, and the peripheral smear is going to give us the type of anemia it could be. And of course, malaria, let us not forget about sickle cell anemia, malaria, and other infections, which are quite common, especially in the southern part of India. So a peripheral smear, it has to be done by a good pathologist to give us this complete picture and the hemoglobin analysis. Like very often we overlook the MCV, MCH. We don't pay a heed to that. I think we need to pay a heed to that so that we know whether it is microcytic hypochromic anemia, which is 
deficiency or it's a megaloblastic anemia yeah so what how would you go about managing this patient dr anit or dr sarita you given her two shots she is already 32 weeks madam because she is not responding we have to evaluate what is the cause but still we have to start doing blood transfusion because she is 7 gram and uh, dietary advice also we have to tell. And uh, uh, if at all we think that uh, stool uh, ova cyst has been done, so if she is having worm infestation, it has to be treated. So whatever deficiency, it has to be treated and blood transfusion. Yeah, that is we have to give her iron. We have to give her, I mean, sorry, we have to give her blood transfusion, folic acid, vitamin, vitamin D. And never forget to deworm the patient also. And you give her high protein diet, you give her a protein rich diet. With all the um, zinc, uh, selenium, and uh, all those uh, multivitamins and uh, trace elements which, which she would require. And of course, if it is thalassemia, we'll, we'll go to that. The patient, if the patient is found to have a thalassemia uh, trait or a thalassemia carrier or hemoglobin equities, how do you go about counseling this lady? Mm -hmm. Anybody can take this question. So the, the couple should be. Uh, the partner, the male partner should also be screened for, uh, hello, ma'am. The male partner should also be started screening for genetic disorder. And if the male is found to be, uh, you know, positive to have the same similar uh, hemoglobinopathy, then amnesty should be offered to find whether the, patient, the baby is a carrier or it is being affected by the uh, disease. And then you should give a folic acid supplementation 5 milligram. And depending upon what type of hemoglobin it is, you need to get additional opinion for a physician or surgeon or whatever is needed. So, um, I, I, can I just add a point onto that? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, let's say you screen the husband and husband is found to be a thousand carrier, then second probably you'll have mutation study for both. Just to see uh, which mutation both of them are carrying. Uh, if it is a similar mutation, then only probably the baby will be affected. And if it is a different mutation, and if it is not causing a uh, heterozygous uh, uh, compound heterozygous uh, kind of feature, then probably the baby will be totally unaffected. So I think a mutation study in between for the parent will have some role to add. Yes, I think so. But since she's 32 weeks, I don't think we would go ahead with an amniocentesis in this particular case. But probably we will do the counseling for her. And then once the baby is born, we will maybe do the screening of the baby and the husband. Of course, we do it immediately to do the counseling. And of course, we, how do we correct the anemia? We have to correct the anemia with blood transfusions and folic acid substitution. And of course, we have to counsel them about the antenatal, I mean, the postpartum screening of the baby and how they go ahead with having the uh, next uh, pregnancy. And as Dr. Basil rightly said, we have to do a genetic counseling. So preferably, I think we can always refer them to a fetal a genetic specialist for the antenatal counseling and management further on. So I think nowadays, many of our consultants, we are doing a routine thalassemia screen. I would like to know from my panelists, how many of you follow this practice? Sorry, how would you? Would do any of you do an anti uh, routine thalassemia screen when women come for preconceptional counseling? Yeah, mm -hmm. I. So basically, we just do the uh, the complete blood picture. In that complete blood picture, we'll just see the MCH and MCV, and if both are less than like let's say less than seventy five and less than twenty five, and if if, it, if that parameters come around, then I look at the RDW and the reticular retic count. Retic count high, RDW is low then uh, probably it might uh, give i have done like uh, um, i have done uh, electrophoresis and uh, uh, and the test for uh, hpc for uh, these uh, hemoglobin factors uh, for a couple of patients i have even found one patient to be a thalassemic but then husband was not so that couple also went fine yeah, even I do follow the same practice, Dr. Basil. I think so. It is a uh, very uh, sensible uh, um, uh, point to that if they are uh, coming for preconceptual counseling, there's always the reason that we offer them these uh, uh, parameters. And you can always get an electrophoresis study also when we're doing a huge battery of investigations for them. There's no harm in doing a thalassemia profile also. I think that is, and most of the Western countries, I think they do do this uh, thalassemia screening for most of their women. And if she is positive or she's a carrier, they go ahead with the husband's screening also. In fact, in uh, Cyprus, it is kind of a rule that you know you cannot marry unless you 
get the certificate. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we also need to move ahead. That's why I wanted this uh, case to be discussed on thalassemia because we don't even give it a thought many, many often. So which of the, this is, I'm just going to one more reason of chronic kidney disease, which today is quite common because thanks to the increased incidence of non-communicable diseases, late marriages, women conceiving late, husbands lining up with, uh, um, I mean, they have some, they go for, I mean, the, the couple go for IVF, ICSI, and they're taking a lot of hormonal management, they're conceiving late. We are seeing women with uh, kidney disease. So how will, what is this association between renal disease and anemia? Because I'm sure many of us do see women who come to us with some sort of a renal um, hampering a renal disease and we have to manage these women. It's more of a hyperproliferative. So basically there is erythropoietin deficiency and then that will lead on to the, the bone marrow, uh, like you know, low bone marrow uh, develop, I mean, um, proliferation. So that is in turn causing anemia. Yeah, more so there's an impaired erythropoiesis because of the, you know that erythropoietin is metabolized in the kidney. So it has to be because there's an altered RBC metabolism and there is impaired erythropoiesis leading to enhanced RBC death and uh, anemia that is resistant anemia and chronic anemia in those women who are having chronic renal disease. So how do we manage these women? By giving erythropoietin, uh, I mean, the regular uh, erythropoietin injections you can manage. So we have to give them iron supplementation and we have to give them erythropoietin stimulating agents like erythropoietin, which is available, PhD inhibitors and AST120 um, has to be given to prevent the long-term mor morbidity and mortality. So we can use carboxymaltase in these women as the first uh, choice. Otherwise, we can always go ahead for blood transfusion rather than oral line. So always um, be aware of these treatment modalities for those women in uh, CKD with anemia. Would any of the other panelists or Dr. Umayal? And we have Dr. Uh, Udaisha uh, Om, Om Prakash, sorry, uh, who has joined us. He can also uh, participate in the panel and give their valuable inputs. And otherwise, we will go ahead with uh, the next. So these are the options available. So now we have a primary. She's 26 years. 20 weeks pregnancy, her hemoglobin is 9 grams, her MCV is 100. How will you manage? Dr. Sushma? This is a megaloblastic anemia. Yes, madam. Dr. Nirmala. Yeah, it's a megaloblastic anemia. So we have to look for the uh, serum levels of uh, vitamin B12 and uh, folic acid and then uh, supplement them. So folic acid deficiency leads to megaloblastic anemia. And of course, it is we have to be very careful that we know that there's a B12 deficiency also. So this is usually dietary and Madam is very well elaborated about what is the rich sources of vitamin B12 and folic acid. So we need to supplement both B12 and folic acid. So how do we supplement? Could any of Dr. Sushma go ahead? Uh, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, dietary supplement of vitamin B Vitamin B12, like fo uh, folic acid uh, rich uh, diet, like uh, uh, green leafy vegetables, which is not fully cooked. And then we should ask them to take even uh, proteins, ma'am, protein rich diet. And, and then we should supplement her with uh, tablets that is dietary supplement, uh, that is uh, tablets that is folic acid 5 mg per day for 15 days. And then it should be followed by 1 milligram per day. Okay, fine. So we have to give them folic acid and vitamin B12, B12 because just vitamin B12 is not going to be helpful. Why? Because we have something called the methylfolate trap. So in the absence of B12, folate in the body exists as methyl tetrahydrofolate. B12 allows the removal of this 5-methyl group. So the conversion and utilization of folic acid is there. So we need to remember that they go hand in hand. So we treat them with oral administration of folic acid 5 milligrams per day for three months, maintenance therapy if it's necessary, and then see the retic count. Correction of anemia is usually um, um, possible in one to two months. And of course, you continue the B12 and uh, dietary supplementation along with the other trace elements. So we come to the last part of the panel. We have a gravida 3 para 2 life 2 32-year-old lady with a full-term pregnancy 
admitted in the labor room. She's been on an irregular antenatal checkup. On examination, she's anemic. She looks pale. She looks exhausted. Her pulse rate is around 98. Her blood pressure is normal. Respiratory rate is almost normal, 26. On examination, uterus is acting. She's got a vertex presentation. The heart is regular. Her vaginal examination is four centimeters. Membrane is present. Vertex at minus one station. Yeah, on uh, getting her param, um, basic investigations, her fever was high grams. Her urine report was normal. She has come un, in a in an emergency without any records. So how are you going to manage this lady? You have required all the panelists we, to give. We have to give, give the blood transfusions. Uh, and then uh, see that uh, along with the diuretics so that she won't go into congestive cardiac failure and then uh, give her a com comfortable position uh, propped up and then oxygen inhalations uh, then uh, cut short the second stage of labor she goes into a delivery and then avoid ergometrin during the third stage then uh, give the prophylactic antibiotics uh, to combat the infection's uh, susceptibility and then continue iron and folic therapy for uh, three more months after delivery. And then, uh, uh, of course, the appropriate contraceptive advice is very much required because she's already anemic and has uh, uh, suffered from this delivery at all. So, can somebody... I think uh, the other panelists can add on. For the echo also in that case, like you no, know, she we have absolutely no idea how she has been anemic for a uh, thing. So how the cardiac status is, she might even suffer from some cardiac dysfunction that might lead on to her morbidity. So in like in two ways uh, for counseling as well as to manage, both will help. Uh, maybe are all for echo. Doctor Doctor Umayal, madam, are you there? She's traveling because. Uh, in Tamil Nadu, the, they have a rule now that all antenatal cases, irrespective of whatever, even if they are normal, a cardiac echo is mandatory. I think the... Yeah, yes, uh, madam. Wonderful. That, that rule is there. Uh, yeah, I think, I think yeah, 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 it's coming. Uh, most of the time what happens is all these um, uh, late onset FGRs or uterine arteries uh, with the high resistance, after the first trimester screening that we get, they have some underlying uh, you know, cardiac... Uh, uh, cardiac pathology and even those cases which develop preeclampsia later on who did not have uh, these uh, increased resistance in the uterine artery in the first trimester as well as in the second trimester and with a normal frontal artery uh, uh, the I mean op, I mean ophthalmic artery uh, index indices they usually end up having some or the other I mean usually have a, a predisposition to cardiac uh, problems also uh, these cases those who are like about 35 years they are also having some underlying problems uh, to the cardiac problem which will not be manifesting the early pregnancy but later on they might so it's like that is a very good initiative by the tamil nadu exactly. i don't know how long it will take for the the kerala government to take it up yeah i think we should do that uh, even in karnataka and the other thing is i think documentation and discussion with these patients is very very important because she's a third gravida Hemoglobin 7, she's already late in labor. The incidence of postpartum hemorrhage is going to be high. Morbid morbidity is going to be high. So please do not forget to document and see that you have help around to mobilize blood if necessary, mobilize a team of uh, a, a, a physician in attendance, a cardiologist, an intensivist, and you need to have your own obstetric colleagues when you manage such cases. And especially in uh, setups where you have a single hospital owners and you're working alone in the setup, please be cautious when you manage this because not only is it the morbidity and mortality of the mother and baby we are concerned, it is even our own morbidity we need to be concerned about. So documentation is very, very important. And very often there is mortality also in the doctors due to violence and uh, stress and all these things. So let us not forget that part of the management in such women. I think it's very, very important. We should not be overconfident. So we shorten the second stage by instrumental delivery. Active management of third stage labor is always going to be there. Of course, avoid methargen and be cautious about cardiac failure. Don't be over judiciously correcting her anemia by repeated blood transfusions. Try to prevent further blood loss, I think. And puerperium, as Dr. Nirmala has already said, rest, folic acid, 
treatment of any infections and effective contraception. And for this woman, if she's anemic, you may not be able to do a people sterilization. You advise vasectomy for her husband or a PPI ECD or even a depot medroxyprogesterone acetate. She has to uh, be uh, told about and then later on go for it. So I think I thank all the panelists now for participating and giving their valuable inputs here. And let us all work towards an anemia muk Bharat and see that our women and children are, health, are healthy. And of course, we are stress-free and we are litigation-free. Thank you very much, Dr. Priyankur Roy and the entire Republic Awareness Committee team for giving me this opportunity. I thank Dr. P.K. Shekharan and Dr. Palani Appan for being the guests of honor, Dr. Vidya Tobi, Dr. Chinmayi, Dr. Umayal to be her being the expert. I think she's traveling. And all my panelists who have uh, taken the panel so beautifully across, though I was a little unprepared, I could not provide the uh, material to you well in advance. I'm, my apologies for that. And thank you very much to all the participants for the patient hearing. And thanks, Corona, for the platform. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. That was indeed a Thank very you, good discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you, Monica. Just to add uh, one Thank you, Satabdi. I think she, madam is traveling. She's not having network to conclude. The chairpersons can conclude the session, I think. Yes, Dr. Basil, you want to say something? Yes. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, so basically, I think we, we forgot about the baby. Uh, since I am more, more into the, the baby, uh, like these babies have a you know problem with the neonatal anemia and uh, very low iron resource reserve. So whenever we are dealing with the pregnancies, iron deficiency, anemic pregnancies, we always have to put forth uh, you know put a word with the neonatologist or the you know the, the parents also that the baby's reserve is going to be very low. And those babies who have got a low iron reserve is often found to found to be associated with uh, even mental retardation not mental retardation, maybe like learning disability and delayed milestones. So that has to be put forward and uh, they might require these iron supplements and uh, uh, for like maybe six months altogether. Like, no, that, that's what I have seen. So that also needs to be considered. Yeah, yeah. Very true. Very true, Dr. Basil. We did speak about the neonatal problems, but we didn't talk, talk about the supplementation. Thank you for adding that point. And I think that has to be in uh, postnatally we have to uh, see that the pediatrician knows about the uh, problem the mother faced and said that he's on uh, on the foot uh, there to correct the um, neonatal anemia and see that the child gets back on track. I would I would like Monica to give the vote of thanks. Monica, are you there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Shetabdi. Uh, Bharti, madam, the panel discussion was icing on the cake and we have had an extensive dis uh, discussion regarding all the causes and as well as the management of anemia in various case scenarios. Thank you, Dr. Vidya Kobi, madam, and Dr. Chinmay Ratha, madam, for an elaborate talk. I would uh, extend my thanks to Palinaptan, sir, and Shekran, sir, who have joined as guest of honor for today's session. Dr. Selvan Ma'am, Dr. Radha Madhuri, Dr. Raghavendra Prasad and Dr. Uma Shankar sir who have consented to be chairpersons. I would also like to thank all the panelists for their excellent inputs uh, to make the panel discussion fruitful. Last but not the least, uh, Dr. Shatabdi Day for being a co-convener and Corona Remedies for providing us with an academic platform. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much. Monica, I just have an appeal. Uh, all yes, my friends, uh, I have contesting for the Foxy Non Communicable Diseases Committee as chairperson. I, the present secretaries of your societies will have to vote. And of course, we have the past secretaries. The voting is going to start from 16th of August to 25th of August. I request all of you to kindly put a word to your present secretaries, whom I will be talking to. And please support me so that I can take up the committee off. A non communicable disease to work for the betterment of women. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Wishing you all the very best, ma'am. Thanks, Dr. Monica. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night and take care. Bye.